Another day, another story. Part 2. Most of the day I lived in our volunteer hut, and most of the time I slept there. It was a semi-basement room. Plus there was a shelter where we could hide from shelling. All the supplies we had in the city were running out. There was a lack of basic things like insulin. People who were undergoing onco therapy stopped receiving their medications. A huge number of people who were on substitution therapy or taking antidepressants were also left without these drugs. But the most catastrophic was the situation of the wounded. Their number was growing every day. According to official data, more than 3,000 civilians died in Mariupol, but I think the real figure is 10,000 to 15,000. Body of a dead civilian on the street in Mariupol, March 27. A huge number of people were admitted to hospitals with shrapnel wounds. They needed antibiotics, sterile dressings. Problems with suture material, that is silk used to stitch up wounds, began. There was a catastrophic shortage of it. The occupants didn't let humanitarian convoys into the city, neither with medicines, nor with food. So our medics did absolutely desperate things to help the patients. We began to sterilize our warm dressings in autoclaves the old-fashioned way. One day in our volunteer center a woman brought sheets cut into strips and twisted like bandages. And we thought, God forbid they should never come in handy. But then we realized that we could get our hands on them, too. I can't say that I personally had big problems with food and water, because our volunteer organization took care of the volunteers themselves. My house and the apartment I rented are now partially destroyed. We had a generator at the volunteer center, we cooked in the field kitchen. But I saw that people were cooking over campfires just outside. The strangest and most horrifying for me was when I saw a man, who was hunting pigeons with a slingshot. He said he had a sheepdog, and there was nothing to feed it. That is, not only people were left without food, but also animals. It was a wild spectacle, fires were burning near the drama theater, and people were cooking porridge in kettles. The theater was bombed a few hours after I left. I had been there several times. It was very overcrowded. There were a lot of families with children in terrible cramped quarters. It was dark, people didn't have enough food and medicine. Everyone was sitting on the floor, wrapped in blankets and plaids, because it was very cold. Unsanitary conditions, horrible smells, many people with colds. In the last week I spent in the city, a house near our volunteer center came in. People in the yard were cooking food over an open fire, mostly women and children. Apparently a drone hit them. It so happened that our volunteer organization was the closest to the place. We immediately rushed there to provide first aid, to get people out. The body of one child, a boy, was just lying on the roadway where the cars were driving. I checked his pulse and realized he was dead. My colleague decided to move the body out of the way. A man, completely gray-haired, ran up to him and said, What are you doing? Where are you taking him? It turned out to be the grandfather whose grandson had been killed. The grandfather asked, What am I going to do with him now? I said, Bury him. And he said, How do I bury him? I don't even have a shovel. It's really a big problem. The bodies of murdered people are still lying on the streets of the city. There's no one and nowhere to bury them. Huge mass graves have formed in the city. To be continued.